All right, perfect. So thank you so much for participating in the second space education and strategic applications conference co-sponsored by American Public University System and the policy studies organization. If you can hear me okay, just put a yes in the chat box when you have a moment so we can make sure sound is going well. We're getting ready to kick off a very fun and exciting session with Dr. Jackie Fowler and Professor David Becker focusing in on creative minds pushing scientific boundaries. So a quick introduction for both of our presenters, and I do want to mention that the following intros are in their own words. Dr. Jackie Fowler is lucky to be a member of the English department at APUS, where she acts as the chair. She is a teacher, writer, and generally passionate about words and their use in speaking and writing. And speaking alongside of Dr. Fowler is Professor David Becker, David is also lucky that Jackie is in the English department at APUS. David is additionally fortunate to have been a public school educator for more than 20 years. He is also a writer and excited to be here to spend some time at this awesome conference. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Fowler and Professor Becker. Hi all, we're so happy to be here today. And it's a place, honestly, that most English professors wouldn't believe they'd ever be presenting at. So this is like a great day for us. Um, I want to thank both Lindsay and Angelique. And on behalf of my colleague, David Becker, settle in. Feel free to ask questions as we move through this. And um, keep an open mind as we start talking about how creativity, creative minds, push scientific boundaries. So one of the things that we know is that science fiction and science writing and creative writing and all kinds of artistic endeavors help to create the science that we live in on a day-to-day -day basis. There's a great quote from Buckland. He was looking at part particularly um, 19th century Victorian age invention and how it led to, to the origin of geology as a science and a scientific field. And, and I love one of the quotes in the book. It said, science is written into existence. In other words, we imagine it into existence first. We, we, we cover that boundary of what is and what can be. And then after it's imagined, it's found, discovered, collected, mapped, or modeled. And I think that's the goal that we're trying to, to show today that there's often a, 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 a distance. We're taught that there's a distance between the scientific mind and the creative mind. And we're here to show that there's really a symbiotic process that happens between both. And I just wanna give you an example of where that may happen. In the early 20th century, there was a series of books by Victor Appleton, although it was actually written by a group of people named Victor Appleton. Um, and the one was called Tom Swift and His Electric Rifle. And in this book, if you think about these books, these are like the, the Hardy Boys or the Nancy Drew series. It was the same thing with the Tom Swift books. And in this book, Tom Swift, the character, develops a, a, a rifle that shoots out a ray of electricity. So a, a young boy read it growing up. And what he thought as a, a scientist, a physicist at, at NASA is, wouldn't that be a cool thing to do? If I could actually create the electric rifle, then policemen wouldn't have to use guns to stop, to stop a crime. And he, his kind of obvious thought is, let me figure out something better than shooting people. Well, I don't know if you figured it out yet what the invention was, but it's Jack Hover from NASA. He created the taser in 1974. It is a direct link, link to science being written. And taser is the first letter of each of, the, each of the words in the title, Tom Swift and his electric rifle. And what he said, um, he said he added the A because he was tired of answering his phone as T-S-E-R. So he added the A between Tom and Swift to make it a taser. So if you've ever wondered how, how the written word, the creativity can push an invention, this is something that Jack Cover thought about as a child before becoming a physicist and putting it into reality. And who hasn't seen Star Trek, right? Who hasn't seen Star Trek? Here's another example, very campy. We think it can't possibly be true if it's on Star Trek. But as a matter of fact, when Star Trek was written in the 60s, there were a lot of scientists who took a lot of hope from, from Star Trek. In fact, the, 
the person who is credited with developing the first phone, the first mobile phone, and it's Martin Cooper from Motorola, has a direct link to the communicators that they spoke on in Star Trek. It was an idea created while he watched the show. And he said famously, Star Trek was not fantasy for us. That was an objective. And so it goes back to the, the Buckland quote where science is written first, right? We believe that science is written first and then discovered. And so one of the things I want you to think about, maybe answer it in the chat. If you're, fe if you're feeling compelled to use the mic, please do just raise your hand and we'll give you access. Because I, I wonder if you think about this question. In your opinion, and from your experiences too, what are the differences between the creative mind and the scientific mind? Just put something in the, in the chat. Think about it. We've all grown up with a distinct difference between the creative mind and the scientific mind. That's what we've been taught. Does anyone have any thoughts? What makes, what are the differences between the creative mind and the scientific mind? Ah, interesting, protocols. So there's an extra, extra piece that goes with the scientific mind the protocols that they have to follow to establish discovery. Anything else? If anyone would like to use the mic, just put your hand up and we'll, we'll get you on the, the virtual hand and we'll get you on the mic. If I could add something there with that one comment that we've got, um, and, and I know that it's uh, Susan Loman Thomas, we have, uh, uh, one of the courses we've got at APUS is going to be a scientific writing course. And so those protocols, those things that are expected of anything that's going to be a, a scientific document, uh, it's essential. It, it's, it must be there or otherwise it's not a scientific document. So those expectations, that's true. It's correct. And definitely something that is an expectation. Well, when we were growing up, when I was growing up, I can say um, there was this definite dichotomy between the creative minds and the scientific minds. We talked about hard science and soft science. We talked about the scientists as, as believing in rationality and logic above all else, and the creative minds as believing more in chaos and imagination in order to create. And yet what we figured out is that both need both sides, right? No scientist is gonna create anything uh, discover anything without some type of creativity. And we find out that we affect each other, the creatives and the scientists, we affect each other, we affect the processes and the products that we create. And, and we interact in the world as it is, and in the world as it might be. And that's the, that's the beauty of the symbiosis, this symbiotic relationship between the creatives and the scientists. And look, we're all a little of both. So there's no hard and fast boundary between them. But in general, what happens with the creatives is we stand in the, the liminal spaces between what is and what might be, right? We stand in those spaces between. We look at what's come before and we try to imagine what could happen next. And we write it or we paint it or we sculpt it. And sometimes just the the mere visualization of the idea of what might be creates the impetus for the next level discovery. One of the, one of the most famous scientific writers is a, a woman, Ursula K. Le Guin. She was, a, she was a pretty interesting person. She believed in the ideas of, um, she believed in the idea of, of opening up alternative spaces. So people wrote, to, to come up with alternative realities. And, and in particular for her, she wanted to see women's rights as something that was really important for an alternative way of, of being. And so she, I just want you to hear a, a small clip of Ursula K. Le Guin speaking about these liminal spaces. I'm gonna move it up a little bit. Book, because I think post-Holocaust books are profoundly immoral because they all say, you know, let's all go have a picnic after the bomb drops. And this is, this is, Ridiculous. This is grotesque. There won't be any picnics after the bomb drops. So I don't know, I don't know quite how to 
All right. They okay. did. I'm, so, I'm, well, that's the answer. I'm then saying there not. are alternative ways to go. Mm -hmm. You see, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I cannot commit myself to that. Uh, most futures, people say science fiction is about the future. Most science fiction isn't about the future. It's simply a sort of alternative world. Yes. Uh, and it's not a serious prediction. There are some people in science fiction who say they are predicting what they think is going to happen, but most of us don't. We are simply saying, what if the world went this way? What, what if this happened, you know? Uh, and you're not supposed to take it seriously as a prediction. So I would, I would claim that exemption for my book, too. On the other hand, it certainly is a statement about the way I wish things would go, <laughs> in a sense. So in, in listening to Ursula K. Le Guin, we find out that she's really interested in those liminal spaces and asking the questions that pushes the next level of science. And that's where we feel the creatives are. So we're gonna spend the rest of this trying to link it together. 1927, one of the most famous, still on the top 100 films of all time, one of the most famous films, Metropolis, was created. And I want you to take a look at this short trailer and, and look at it, if you can, not through 2021 eyes, but through 1927 eyes. Notice the science. Notice what's happening in this. And see if you can, see if you can just store it. Remember how it will affect space, space studies. And, oh yeah, me too. Me too, Curtis. I love this one. Now you'll find that um, it's a, first of all, it's pretty risque, huh? That 1927 metropolis. But you'll see in there, if you can look at it, not in 2021 eyes, but in 1927 eyes, you're gonna see a lot of science in there. And a lot of science that might lead, wasn't yet discovered, but might lead to space studies. So in the chat, in your opinion, how was the liminal space between what is and what might be in space studies explored in Metropolis? So the artist, Fritz Lang, stepped into that liminal space to imagine what might be. He's, he's thinking about what might be, including space studies. So if, you're, if you'd like to come on, on mic, please just raise your, digit, your virtual hand and we'll, we'll get there to, to you. If not, just throw it, throw it in the... In the um, in the chat. Add up one more time. Let's just move back. So in your opinion, how was the liminal space between what is and what might be in space studies explored in Metropolis? Anybody? I know it's Friday afternoon, you guys, but it's not a test. <laughs> mm hmm. Mm hmm. And notice the types of transformations, transportation. Notice the themes that we see in Metropolis. 
Alice. Notice the danger of unfettered science. These are all directly related to the main themes that will come out of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which is considered one of the first scientific novels, modern science fiction novels. Um, Metropolis is portraying that idea of what happens when science runs amok. And so even with space studies, it's, it's worried about ambition getting in the way of good sense, okay? Does anyone wanna come on mic and say anything about it? Yeah, there's a lot about the economic classes, Curtis. It's really a big, a, a, the, the working class literally lives underground in Metropolis. And so they come up to do the work for those who have more money. And it's, it, it, it's really displaying social issues of the time in a social justice kind of way. So one of the things that happens to create the, the liminal space for artists to step into, the creatives, is we need to realize the theoretical models. We need to be creating the theoretical models so that that space, that liminal space between what is now and what can be is realized, okay? So we, we think about, when we think about space studies, we think about looking to the heavens and we've all looked to the heavens. Humanity has long looked to the heavens. But it's both the scientists and the creatives that have guided its, its um, understanding of what it sees and what it might see. Okay, so we're not gonna, we're, we're trying not to distinguish between the two because we're both. We're both creative and we're both scientific. But we, we might choose one side of the, the, the end of, or not. So I wanna toss this over to my colleague, David Becker. And I, I just took some notes here I, from what Jane said and, and uh, Jane Forbes and what uh, Kurt's got. And I, I know Jane's uh, for sure. We'll come back to in a minute because I like what Jane Jane noticed the idea of the old ways of thinking like biplanes and, and whatnot, because that's it's important that we're some of the creative things that people come up with are limited by whatever society has at the time. So before we go to space, we have to get there. And one of the things I, I like a lot about, you know, some of the things we'll talk about and some of these these uh, issues is that we first have to talk about Darwin. We have to talk about how we get here. And and Darwin, you know, he's the father of evolution, which I'm sure if you all don't know that, I'm sure a lot of you do. So he's, he's the first person that, or at least the first significant person, let's put it that way, that put things together in a way that people could understand to try to identify what how how we get how, how animals uh, evolve from one point to another the the picture that's the background here is a famous uh, illustration that darwin created um, but you know generally considered to be the father of evolution i don't know that anybody would disagree except it wasn't agreed upon in society at the time you know it's not until the 1940s or 50s where it kind of becomes something that everyone can agree with they say well you know um, yeah, Darwin, we think Darwin's right, uh, but it took a long time to get there. You know, Origin of the Species is 1859. We're talking about 100 years worth of debate and discussion to decide whether or not uh, we're going to agree with Darwin. Is evolution real? And of course, uh, you know, this is a minor point with all the things going on today, but you still have people that uh, want to debate how true or how real um, evolution is. This picture in the background, though, is important because as we've already seen, you know, with the two, two films we've got specifically uh, with Metropolis, so words are great, a script is great, but it's the images as well that are going to give us something that, that can help carry influence. And we know this. I mean, it's the five senses. You know, you can read it and see it that way, sure. But when you get the, the creative images that, that film uh, can provide or, or the written word can provide and then you turn into film, uh, these are the sort of things that that happens. So before we have space, that's when we, we get to Darwin. But Darwin revolutionized uh, our thinking about the nature of the world uh, in other ways too. So it's not just in uh, what we see here with this. There's, there's a couple different ways and, and it's important. So you have to keep in mind what's happening at the time in society. If we're saying 1940 or 1950, about the time that Darwin is considered to be you know, somebody we can believe and we can we can go with that theory. Uh, this is the end of World War II. And I'm sure we can all understand the significant event in the history of the world. And of course, depending on which side you're on, uh, your life has changed immeasurably. So uh, this is the time when so many things are happening around the world and among them 
you have some authors, you have some scientists kind of working together and they take Darwin's idea about evolution or they, this idea that we can think and we can, you know, the liminal space that we were talking about, we hang out in that space, but now we can take that space and go someplace with it. And so there's some significant, some important uh, pieces of writing that are written about that time. Uh, mentioned on the slide here is something from Arthur C. Clarke, and that's Childhood's End. Uh, but Darwin's work, the things that Darwin has, has talked about, um, kind of gives us an opportunity for hope and positivity. There's no doubt after World War II that the entire world just lived through terrible events. In fact, the Le Guin quote talking about the Holocaust, you know, everybody just lived through that. A lot of negativity, a lot of things that, that could be bad, and yet some of the people that we're discussing here, they absolutely take this and see it as a, a jumping off point for positivity, for, for man's uh, potential, humankind's potential. And that's, of course, where we get to space. And so mentioning Arthur C. Clarke there, Childhood's End, um, Arthur C. Clarke wrote a lot of things. There's an obvious one with, that we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, but before we, we get to uh, what is probably his biggest work, we're still talking about 1951. This is, again, just after World War II. And his this idea of evolution gets everybody thinking about it, captures the imagination of, of everybody, um, you know, whether you like it or, or don't like it. And so here's this guy, Arthur C. Clarke, who's a scientist. You know, he's, he's an artist, he's a writer, but he's a scientist. And he takes the idea of evolution and, and he puts the people on Mars. This is what the book's about, The Sands of Mars. He's got a little, little old school book cover there. And this is what people are thinking about. And you notice this is a quote from the text that's there in, in orange there at the bottom of the screen. You know, all these different things that are happening on the planet. It's a triumph of evolution. Well, we're not on Mars. That's not where we are. And yet this is something that, that Clark's putting in his work. So evolution, Darwin's evolution has become a, an accepted idea, accepted enough that we can take it and then jump off from there. We can build from there and come up with something else. Uh, well, he continues. And so a slide ago, we mentioned Childhood's End. Well, Childhood's End uh, becomes this really important text. And only lately uh, has it now been, been uh, you know, brought to the small screen, admittedly. But it's, it's an early book that's a triumph for him because it really got people thinking and it's got some, some great ideas. So there's references to humanity's past. Remember, negativity in the past. And in fact, this, this awful little creature that's on your screen right now is one of the good guys in his writing because supposedly in the book back in the day, devils showed up, people that look like demons and whatnot. And they really were good people. And the book talks about how this is where humanity is now going to evolve, the big word, the Darwin word, going to evolve into something in the future. And, and that's the sort of thing that's happening there, that humanity's evolution is the plot. That's the point of the book. And of course, the title helps us out to Childhood's End. Human beings are no longer this childlike species. They've now taken the next step forward. Uh, and, and so it's, it's not that Darwin's right. You know, again, this is 1950s. Darwin's not right, but he didn't go far enough. And we can go further. And of course, that's what the book's about. The book is about the idea that, that now we're going to space. And I'm sure we all recognize, you know, after 1945, you know, we've got the space race happening. That's something that's going on here. And so for a long time, you know, what mentioning Darwin, mentioning World War II, but it actually goes much further than that. It goes further back than that. And the idea is that there's things that have happened. You know, we look to the heavens, look at the, the slide here and what we see, the harvest moon was the other night, right? If you were happen to have no clouds, you could actually see it. People are looking up at this moon that's a different color. They look to the heavens, they look to what's up in the sky and, and use that in, in their writing to try to figure out what's happening there. So uh, I'll return this back to Dr. Fowler here for a second, uh, for a little bit and talk about this, this is a lot further back than you, you might think. And, and that's where Dr. Fowler is going to bring us. Yeah. So we, it's generally recognized that modern science fiction begins with Frankenstein in 1818, Mary Shelley's most famous um, contribution to literature. And the, the thing is with, with Frankenstein is that we're gonna come back to this, but it's not the first piece of science fiction. It's not the first image or word that has us looking towards the heavens. Uh, I wanna tell you a real quick story. A couple of years ago, my son and I um, went to Egypt and 
I had a paper due for a journal. I had an academic paper due that I was running late on. So as we drove from Cairo into Giza, I was typing away on my laptop trying to finish it. And my son, who's normally quiet, was saying to me, mom, mom, mom. And I really wasn't paying attention until it got more urgent. And finally, I looked to him and watched, followed his gaze out the window. And there on the horizon, the horizon of Giza, I see the Great Pyramid begin to emerge from the sands. And I don't know how many times I had seen the image of the Great Pyramid. And I don't know how many times I read about it in, the, in National Geographic or Time or seen it on TV or saw it in a movie or, or wherever the millions of times I'd seen the, the, the Great Pyramid, nothing. And I mean, nothing prepared me for the magnificence that I saw in front of me. It was jaw dropping. And, and I got to thinking about how we often think of the ancients as not as sophisticated as us creatively or scientifically, yeah? And that point was driven home the next day when I went to the Valley of the Kings, like the Great Pyramid. I had seen the, the paintings on the tomb walls in, in all kinds of venues. Nothing prepared me to, to see the magnific magnificence of it inside the, the, the caves themselves. It was hot. We're in the desert. It's, it, it, there's no air conditioning inside, and it, it's stuffy, and the, the sunlight just filters in through the cave tunnel, and yet the colors on the wall were the most vibrant colors I'd ever seen in painting. But in one particular tomb, in one particular section of the wall, I stood for almost an hour and just tried to wrap my head around what was happening on the wall. And so one of the things I learned is that the, the paintings on the wall are sometimes literal. It could be just what's in the tomb. It's an inventory sometimes. And sometimes they're not literal. They're what ifs. And there's a series of paintings in one of the tombs where you can see this disc. You see this disc here, you see this disc here. And it's coming in from the sky. There's a series of shots of this disc, paintings of this disc coming in from the side, from the sky. And then it lands in Egypt and it opens. And you can see the opening here, right? Down here on the bottom. And then up here, you can see the person starting to emerge from the disc that just came from the sky. And in the next few panels, there's, there's the person who emerged from the disc that came from the sky has what only can be called a space helmet on. I mean, it looks like the modern day space helmet. So I, I wanna backtrack for a second and tell you that one of, one of the things that my children and I joke about a lot is that I, I fear, my greatest fear as an academic is to be faced with this, this terrible choice between maybe someday being offered a fact check, fat check to, to appear on ancient aliens or to guard my academic integrity. And, um, and so as I stood in front of the wall, I thought, oh my God, I'm facing the choice. What am I believing here? What's going on? I'm gonna be on ancient aliens, you know? Until I realized I'm an English professor and what's happening on this wall is a, what might be. They're standing in the liminal space between what they know and what could be. And they're asking, they're painting it in images. Could this happen? Could this be true? And so I, I, what I love about the picture of the, the, the character in the space helmet is that we, we kind of followed it how many centuries later. But you know, the ancient Egyptians couldn't be outdone. The ancient Greeks wouldn't let the ancient Egyptians be outdone. So there's this guy, Lucian of Samosata, and he wrote the true history, a true history, not a novel, a true history in the second century AD. And he, the plot of his story is like almost something that you would expect. Maybe the last part is not as, as, as what you would expect, but it's, it's kind of a trope. We've seen it a hundred times. And here it is, a Greek ship's out in the, in the water and the water starts to churn and the tempest um, picks up the ship and with, through some kind of propulsion, sh shoots it through the sky, out through the atmosphere until until the hapless crew ends up on the moon. And when they disembark, they're in the middle of a war between the king of the moon and the king of the sun, okay? Now, this is a trope. We've seen this, this storyline over and over and over again.
but the second century AD Greeks did not. This is pretty new, right? This is a pretty new conceptualization of a what if, what might be. And notice again, the title, A True History. And I just wanna point out in the second century AD, Lucian um, would not be that far from the, the non-abstract thinkers of, of the Greeks who believed in the Greek pantheon. You know, like they thought thunderbolts came from Zeus throwing a thunderbolt. Thunder, I mean, came from the thunderbolts. They, they thought sexual desire, we had, we, we had to give thanks to Eros and Aphrodite for sexual de desire and, and blame Ares for our penchant for war. They believed that Prometheus was the one that delivered the fire to humanity and the gods punished him by putting him on a mountain and having his liver eaten out every, each and every day. And the idea of the fire, what, what makes that such a grave mistake by Prometheus is that once he gives humanity fire, we're not afraid of the dark anymore. We start to be able to see things more abstractly and the gods lose control of us. And so in giving us the fire, we become more powerful. Which you may not know about the, the, the story Frankenstein is that her subtitle is the modern Prometheus. It's a direct, in a direct line from the idea of taking something that we're not particularly sure of and creating it through ambition. And Mary Shelley, through her portrayal of Frankenstein, remember this is the first modern science fiction. She's really talking about this struggle we have between the creatives and the science scientists, between rationality and imagination. She wants, to, she wants us to consider what happens with unfettered progress, especially when it's for ambition. And so Dr. Frankenstein in the book has this need to be right, this need to be famous, this need to create, and it clouds his, his understanding of what might happen. And so Mary Shelley forces us to look at what the unintended consequences are of, of unfettered science. And, and she adds a social and moral voice to that. But it also explores the liminal area between the what if, the what is, and the what might be. She's between discoveries. And in 1818, she creates a book that uses, uses science well, at least science for the day. She's not the only one. Soon after her, we have Jules Verne. Now, Jules Verne was quite the kicker when it came to scientific use. Um, he was, uh, I don't know if anyone has ever read Jules Verne, but he would wax eloquently about, about the science of what he was trying to portray. And in fact, um, the inventor of the submarine used Jules Verne's original book to create a submarine. Like he used the plans that Jules Verne talked about in a, in a fiction. And, and also the first helicopter, the man who created the first helicopter used Jules Verne, his, his writing about the helicopter as, a, as, a, as the template for creating it bigger. But for space travel, he wrote from the earth to the moon in 1865. Now it's important for you guys to know that Jules Verne had not ever visited the United States before this book was published, but he did afterwards. And he spent chapters discussing the science that would enable a man to be propelled from the earth to the moon, including, and I think this is an interesting part, including a part where there's a, a layer of water that as, as, the, as the astronaut, of course they didn't call them that, but as the, as the man was propelled out of the earth's atmosphere, the water would cushion the impact of that for the man. So the first impact going through would be cushioned by the water. Look at, look at the, the shape of his, his idea of what a spaceship would look like and listen to how he describes it. The entrance into this metallic tower was by an, a narrow aperture contrived in the wall of the cone. This was hermetically closed by a plate of aluminum fastened internally by powerful screw pressure. The travelers could therefore quit their prison at pleasure as soon as they should reach the moon. And what you don't know is the first line in this section, which is really kind of incredible. Remember I said Jules Verne had never visited the US, not least until after this book was published. And yet his, his story, this section begins with this, a great cannon having been cast in place in the soil of Florida. And when you look at the way he describes where it would be, 
it's very close, very close to the modern day Cape Canaveral. And in fact, NASA suggests that they used a lot of Jules Verne's science in order to, to do the first moonshot. This is a man in 1865. So here is an example where Jules Verne stands in that liminal space between what is and what can be, and, and scientists use it to create the next step. And so early on, after Jules Verne, after Lucien, after we, we have a series of, of films that are really intent on space travel. It's the really, it's the beginning of us trying to understand how we reach the moon, right? There's a, there's a movie, um, there's a movie called La Voyage dans la Lune that was written by Georges Millet. And it was lost for, for, for almost a century and finally just found. And, um, and it's an interesting thing. I want you to just take a, a look at this. And again, see if you can view this with 1902 eyes, not, 19, not 2021. So we're talking almost 120 years ago, this was created. And I just wanna give you a, a, a quick video um, of this. So you can see what it, what the science of the time is, is doing here. It is a silent film, so there's no music in this one. And by, by, by the way, all of you scientists out here, there you are right here. These are the scientists, the white bearded older men. Remember too, something in 1902, most people had never seen a movie, moving picture. And so it, it's stunning on all levels. As an English teacher, I can't help but think these are these people were all born in the Victorian age and we're still watching them today, which is pretty incredible. And there you have the man in the moon. Who is now none too happy. So the question is, but not even thinking about, not even thinking about how incredibly um, 
unbelievable moving pictures would be. But think of you, put yourself in a 1902 mindset and think, how was the liminal space between what is and what might be in space exploration explored in La Voyage dans la Lune? What kinds of things did they do that, that predates modern space science? And you can write it in the, in the chat. You can raise your virtual hand. We'll, we'll open the mic for you, whatever you'd like to do on this one. My colleague, David, has the, the app. So David, feel free. Yeah, keeping an eye on the app and the, the chat there. I know we had the one comment there and we have, I don't know how many people, there's a bunch of people that are in there too. So either way is fine. I know people often are viewing things on their mobile devices. It's not a bad way to interact. <laughs> even, if, even if you don't write it for us, I hope you're thinking through it. It's a pretty incredible thing that happens in that 1902 film. Um, some of the science is correct, even though it's far predates what we know about space exploration, or at least it's imagining it right. And so what happens once the science becomes theory? What happens once the, the paintings, the images, the words become theoretical? Well, a lot of times the creatives then popularize the theoretical models. And so again, we've looked towards the heavens for, for forever and through the recursive nature of science, and it is recursive, science, fiction, parody, and self-image, the creatives have interpreted the science for the interested. And I wanna turn it over now to my colleague, David Becker. I'm looking back at that comment from earlier on, and this, this is, connects to that last question that, that uh, Dr. Fowler put up there. It, this is from Jane a little bit ago, um, you know, the idea of you know, people seeing biplanes and whatnot. And starting with our very first item that Dr. Fowler gave us with the Egyptians, you know, you're seeing these things that nobody'd seen before. Ideas, something that's new, something that's that's unique. So that, that again, the liminal space, people creating things, and they're in the middle trying to find how things are. Well, well, here's where we are. Look, if we're going to talk about uh, any type of science fiction, uh, there's lots of it out there. There's there's lots of bad stuff out there, um, but one of the the most important science fiction films, uh, really throughout science fiction, uh, and this includes the written too, is going to be Arthur C. Clarke's 2001, A Space Odyssey. Now, we've mentioned Arthur C. Clarke already. That's, you know, dealing with the, the sands of Mars and, and then, uh, of course, Childhood's End. Well, 2001 is probably the one that everybody might be most familiar with. Um, it is it's everything. It's, it's going to have something that's going to be impressive for the visual aspect of it, because so many very creative things uh, show up there. And, and we have a, a little clip here to show you, but I mean, this is the movie poster in the background there, and it's still got this very kind of cool 60s vibe to it. But there's so much more there. The music stands out and is significant. There's so many parts to it uh, that are uh, worth looking at here. And we'll, I think we've got the the one the clip from Hal, who's the computer. Uh, if you haven't seen this, this is a, a I, I don't know if we'd argue that this is exactly the climax to the movie, but it's pretty close because we're dealing again with, with uh, AI, advanced intelligence, artificial intelligence that is capable of doing stuff. And, and now we're faced with something that's, you know, our, our main characters here face to face. We've got you know, on the one hand, an advanced AI named Hal, on the other, on the other hand, uh, Dave Bowman, a, an astronaut, and this is one of the big scenes that you see there, friend. I think we do have sound for this one, right? Hello, Hal, do right. you read me? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Do you read me, Hal? Do you read me, Hal? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Hello, Hal, do you read me? Affirmative, Dave. I read you. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. What are you talking about, Hal? 
This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. I don't know what you're talking about, Hal. I know that you and Frank were planning to disconnect me. And I'm afraid that's something I cannot allow to happen. Where the hell did you get that idea, Hal? Dave, although you took very thorough precautions in the park against my hearing you, I could see your lips move. And so there's there's a lot more that goes into this movie too. And of course, this is an important part, but you know, we talked before about the evolution of man. What's the next thing? This movie shows two different possible evolutions of man. Man creates artificial intelligence. That's where it comes from. And at the same time, at, without ruining or spoiling the movie for the possibility somebody hasn't seen it, as the movie ends, we get this very real expectation from Clark and from Kubrick, to be fair, Kubrick, the director, what the next step for humanity is what is the next thing whether that'll ever happen of course is a is an open question but you know it's talking about those things and and so we're kind of back to frankenstein a little bit here the idea of of what mankind is capable of and that's both good and bad and of course if if man creates the ai and ai kills man that's still a flaw of man and that's still a problem and so that's you know uh, clark explores that in a pretty fair amount. And now there's a lot of science that went into a lot of his writing and, and 2001 is, is no exception to that, but it's such a significant piece of writing, such a significant uh, artifact really is what we can call it. Uh, it. It's important to bring up now Clark, the author as a scientist, what he was able to do. And of course he was able to do a number of different things. First of all, and this is the most recent one, we'll bounce around a little bit with the timetable on these, but in 2001, the Mars Odyssey. So when they're sending the spaceship, this is a picture in the background of what that looks like, which by the way, if you were watching the, the video there for a second, uh, it looks a little bit like this, the primary spaceship that's in the movie, right? It's got this long spindly neck to it. So there's a, you know, even the visual uh, connections there. Well, this sends the, we send, NASA sends this ship to Mars and they name it the 2001 Mars Odyssey, absolutely and purposefully a reference to uh, this work from Arthur C. Clarke. Um, and of course, it's looking for life. It's looking for stuff on Mars that is, you know, maybe we go there. Maybe we can, uh, you know, participate, live on Mars and do things on Mars. Um, and then this odyssey, the, the, the spaceship actually predicted water, which was then confirmed. So that's a, a, just a giant movement. And, and of course, this is a while ago, 20 years ago. But you might remember, if this is something you like, you might remember that time reading in the news or hearing in the news, they discovered water on Mars. So even with this, this gigantic uh, discovery, you're still dealing with something that Arthur C. Clarke did. And even more, again, another connection with the movie, that spaceship ended up being something that kept us connected to Mars. He's a lot, Arthur C. Clarke is, is responsible for an awful lot more. He basically invented satellites. So here's a guy that wrote a ton of things. He invents satellites, and not just that, but he invents what we use satellites for, he creates and he, he writes about what we know as GPS. This is all from Arthur C. Clarke. He's the guy that wrote it and wrote papers on orbital mechanics. Now, as time goes on, the approximate location up in space where we place satellites, it's a little more complex than that, of course, but where we, we put these things, they've named it the Clark Belt, the Clark Orbit, this location in space, this, this distance from Earth, is named after him because he's the guy that thought about putting things there in the first place. And he's not just doing scientific papers as we've shown, he's also writing about it. But the last one is, is I think my favorite because he started thinking about, you know, again, cell phones, GPS, stuff like that. But he started thinking about how to find astronauts, excuse me, asteroids rather, that might pose a risk to the earth. He created something in, in his writing called Space Guard well, Space Guard eventually turned into what's known, and this is a, a little picture from NASA, Asteroid Watch. So Arthur C. Clarke decades ago is, has got this idea about, hey, we need to make sure we pay attention to what could happen to Earth. And I, I noticed there that uh, Susan mentioned in the chat there about you know th this director thinking about the damage to the moon, right? The damage that might happen if, there, if we're going to go there. Well, there's damage that can happen on Earth too. And this is Clarke's 
uh, uh, focus or his, his uh, uh, influence on what we do, uh, still today, we're, we're making sure that, you know, nothing's going to hurt us and, and affect humanity in a negative way. So it's a little peculiar that we're now going to segue into a, um, an amazing movie that I happen to love and is far deeper than you might think. In fact, I, I had to lead with this quote here because Galaxy Quest is this amazing movie. And that's my opinion. And that's fine. But I can prove it. Thank you, Jane. I can prove it because if you didn't know this, and we're going to explain why this is more liminal space stuff. This is a, a quote from a, a NASA astronaut, uh, Nicole Stott. I want to say she was, she's been in space or had been in space over 100 days. This is somebody that's a seasoned astronaut. And so she's interviewed by, by this magazine. He said, what's your favorite space movie? What, what's the thing you think that uh, embodies what, what we see, what we do when we're in space? And without hesitation, I mean, like an instantaneous response, Galaxy Quest and blew everybody's minds. What are you talking about? It's a comedy. It's, it is a, unquestionably meant to be funny. And she said, the best people you're gonna work with are the ones you're gonna have a good time with. You're gonna to come together, you're gonna to solve the problem. And, and these are key parts to, to Galaxy Quest. Um, and, and yeah, it does poke fun at things, which of course is important and that, that matters. We've got you know this, this one, uh, uh, one of the different people, the scientists writing about it, talking about all the different things there that it, it replicates images of space. So it still talks about it. I absolutely love this clip. So in case no. you don't know the joke, this is the internal, internal joke. Shatner always has to Man. take his shirt off in Star Trek. So we'll let this play for a moment. Yes, Mr. Spock, what is it? Is there something I can do for you, Captain? Like what? Well, Dr. McCoy seemed to think that I should check on you. That's nice. Come on, Spark, I know that look. What is it? Well, our good doctor said that you were acting like a wild man demanded brandy. <laughs> our good doctor has been putting you on again. Yeah, so we're drinking in space and we have our shirts off, right? Very good. So, but then, and I'll, I'll make the, the liminal connection in a minute. Well, this is a clip from Galaxy Quest here, and, and I'll let this play too. It's about a minute long. Um, it's kind of the same sort of thing. That was the show. I'm not that guy. Fred, you never forgot a line. You never missed a bar. Oh, oh. It's not me anymore, man. Yes, you, Fred. You just stop trying. You can do this, Fred. I know in my heart you're going to save my life. So absolutely. So, so we've got two things going on in that clip right there. Absolutely making fun of Star Trek and the idea that, that why is, why is anybody in space taking their shirt off? It doesn't make any sense, like walking around and drinking, but I want to come back to the astronaut, Nicole Stott's quote there. We're going to solve the problem. This one of the primary parts about this movie, what, and you could find a tremendous amount about this. People use this as, for leadership seminars. This is a movie from, from a number of years ago and people are using this as, as something that, like a tent pole, for, to, to base a philosophy around. And because it's the idea of, hey, when we work together, we can solve anything. This is what the astronauts say. This is the same sort of thing. And so why, why I think that Galaxy Quest fits with this is it's, it's bathing in divinity. It's this idea of, of all of the stuff that could possibly happen. So if, remember, we, we talked about Frankenstein. If erring is human, right? If, if mistakes are where the, the or excuse me, humans are where the mistakes come from. Well, that's space. It's literature. It's all these things. It's this is this, these are the sort of things that humans do, and the flaws that we see in humanity in the early texts, like Frankenstein. Again, that could be its own presentation. But 
but Galaxy Quest is talking about the positivity. We we forgive that. We move past that. We get rid of all the simple basic stuff like a guy with a shirt off. Tim Allen, by the way, in case you didn't know who that was. We move past that to dealing with the fans. It's like this winking at the people saying, you know what? The fans, the people that enjoy science fiction, whether they're astronauts or common people, you move past that. And they're strong, competent individuals who part of the supportive group and culturally integrated group. And, and it, that's one of the primary parts of this. And yeah, it's a comedy, but that's why it goes. And so now we lead into the most recent thing we'll talk about here, but definitely something that continues the community aspect of, of the liminal space and, and, and where this creativity goes. But let's pause for a second. So all of the things we've talked about, look, you can look in the sky and you can see the moon. It's there. We know what the moon is. There's so many things that, okay, we, maybe we don't completely understand it, but we know it's there. We, we grasp that. But black holes are this really different thing. And the idea that, you know, it's something's up there. Theoretically, it's supposed to be there, you know, a long time ago, before 1800, we have, we have different scientists suggesting they think it's there. We get into Einstein, right? Einstein is the theory of relativity. And he predicts that black holes should be there. Okay but no one knows what they look like. No one knows what they are. And so you get a campy movie that you see here. This is, by the way, the movie poster you're seeing here is absolutely not an example of good science. It's not an example of, of I mean, it's, it's as a child watching the movie, it was really scary, but it's not good science. The black hole is the name of it. There's some, some famous actors and stuff in it, but it still doesn't explain. The movie's about the black hole. It's in the title and you still know nothing at the end of it that you didn't know at the beginning. So fine. All right. But of course, in our recent history, we've got a movie that came out not too terribly long ago called Interstellar. And Interstellar is significant in so many ways. Now, I'm choosing, of course, to focus on uh, our presentation today and, and specifically, uh, as we started here, with black holes. There's a lot to like about the movie beyond that. There's things a lot of people might not like beyond that as well. But Interstellar, so Christopher Nolan is making the movie and, and getting all the different things that Christopher Nolan makes. Um, attention to detail is, is an important uh, uh, part of who he is. And so he enlists the help of a Nobel Prize winning scientist, Kip Thorne. He says, all right, we're going to do this movie. He's got a story and that's him. Sure, fine. But he enlists the help of Kip Thorne, who is, is I guess, if we, we if we went back, we don't have to. If we went back to that last slide, like he's a fan, he's a nerd, he's kind of this sort of guy that's talking about. You know, he's part of the community. He interacts with people, and you know, if you were to say something, Kip Thorne made a mistake. Kip Thorne will contact you and he'll engage you and say, "Hey, here's my paper. Um, let's talk about this." So Kip Thorne's a fan. Well, Nolan gets Kip Thorne and says, "All right, we're gonna make." a movie about black holes. So what do we do here? And so as you can see from the quote here, that's an orange. So the film is in all the pretty images and it is beautiful. There's a lot of things about the film that are, that are really great to look at, but it's trying to bring them in and uses the, the imagery, uses the visuals to get people to learn something new. And the vis visuals are important in just a second. Maybe they'll think about being a scientist because we need scientists, right? That's important. So the primary point to bring up, it's not the only one, but the primary point is that in Interstellar, the depiction of a black hole, and, and this is something that there's really nothing to argue about because a lot of people talk about this, the depiction of Gargantua, which is the name for the black hole that's in the movie. It's the most accurate depiction of a black hole in cinema. It is what a black hole is supposed to be, right? So we've got a couple images here. On the top is an image from the movie. And so that's what uh, the... Uh, the black hole gargantua looks like, and it's a little complex. I won't attempt to get in the entire thing here, but the idea is that, you know, the black hole exists in multiple dimensions. That's why we see that kind of curved uh, line at the top there, and it, it, it loops around. You know, it doesn't exist just in three dimensions. And so the bottom picture, since the movie came out, years after the movie came out, of course, it's just two years ago. This is an image, the first image of what a black hole looks like. And look, I understand looking at this, no, they're not identical and I understand that. But now based on what the movie showed us, which we'll talk about in a second, the image, the first image of a black hole ends up looking just like what Gargantua is, what Gargantua was from the movie. And that's significant for a bunch of different ways. And so remember, we talk about how does the creativity 
push the boundaries, stretch our knowledge. How does it, how is it positive? How does it do these things? And so out of this, this movie, first of all, the, the visual artists, the, the people that created this, and again, with Kip Thorne, because he helped with the uh, publication, they ended up publishing a paper that, that details how, when they're making this movie, they're actually, you know, the CGI, they're doing the illustrations. They learned, along with physicists, not just Kip Thorne, but others, the light wasn't doing what it should. They plug it all into a computer and it looks funky. It's doing weird things. Remember, I said it's more than just three dimensions. And as they're trying to illustrate this movie, all of these people at the same time had this aha moment, like, wait a minute, that's how it's going to move when light is, is in a black hole or near a black hole. This is how it's going to be. So you get this movie from Christopher Nolan with physicists, and they end up making a discovery about how the light moves when, when impacted by gravity at that level. And again, of course, we won't, there's others out there. We'll see other movies. We'll do this or books. We'll do this later. But the primary point here is that it's, once again, your creativity pushing boundaries. And the bottom one, very quickly, after the movie, they start thinking about, hey, wait a minute, the, what we've got with the, the images here, and, and again, that, that picture there of Gargantua, there's a little planet there. Now the suggestion is because we see how light moves around, around that space, a planet, and there's a little tiny planet, so about middle top of that uh, picture there, the top picture, you see, yep, where the cursor is going, that's a planet, and the suggestion is now looking at this, again, the physicists, the scientists, they go, wait a minute, we think that you could live that close to a black hole, you wouldn't die, you wouldn't be ripped apart by the forces of nature, so if we're looking for a place where life is possible around the entire universe, the movie's shown us that now we have to expand our, our dimensions just a little bit more, because we have to consider the fact that now this entire collection of places around the universe isn't barren. It's possible to live there too. And again, this comes from a movie. And admittedly, again, uh, it's a good movie. I think it's a good movie. But it came up with all these ideas that, that weren't there before. Uh, so again, trying to see all the time and energy they put in to make this movie good. And, and uh, Dr. Fallon and I were talking about <laughs> one of, the, one of the, the biggest uh, things people don't like about the movie. You gotta, I'm showing you all this science that's here. And one of the primary parts about it is that love conquers all. All right, fine. Well, that's great. I, I'm not going to argue that. The point, however, is, um, you know, we're, we're focusing on the science of it, and it's substantial. It's a substantial deal that, that it talks about here. So, and love as, conquers all is a pretty, pretty good theme in an English Well, department. it is, right? We bring up Chaucer and all the other fun stuff with that. So as we, as we get close to the end here, and we, we still have some time left, and we'd like to hear from you if you have things to say, you know, in your opinion, and we've shown you a bunch of stuff, we're ignoring a lot of things that are happening in society right now and have been happening for some time, right? So we're ignoring those things, but just the same, are we on the edge? We're in the precipice of, of a post-scientific world where you've got these two sides like, well, yeah, the science works and it happens, but then maybe it doesn't. And humanity's only about the bad things like we saw in Frankenstein. Where are we with that? And that's the sort of thing to, to answer in the, in the chat there to maybe put in again, we've got, I've got the app open here too, although we've got a couple of people checking too. What's your opinion about that? Are we in the precipice of a, of a post-scientific world or what? And again, I, I'll stop. So I know Dr. Fowler's got some things to say. Yeah, I think, I think one of the things David and I talked about as we went through it, we didn't expect to get to the end and say, oh my God, we're reverting back to the understanding of science as an excess to a world where we we have people who don't believe in climate change, even though it sits in front of us every single day, or refuse to take a vaccine, but takes ivermectin to or hydro, hydroxychloroquine instead. I mean, we so we we were looking at what's happening in modern day society and thinking, what's going on? Are we are we seeing a backlash to science? What what is going on? What do you guys think? And Alex, that's a great point too, because I, I agree with you completely that, look, we're never going to know everything. I, I, I don't want to start making a catalog, making a list of all the things we don't know, because there's, it's everything. I mean, we don't know very much at all. Uh, you know, we still don't grasp everything that happens in our own oceans, and that's on Earth. You know, that's here. Mm -hmm. So uh, absolutely, Alex, I agree that there's so much more to learn. And that's, what, again, why we're pushing these boundaries. We're trying to create uh, things and, and add to the canon of what we know. Um, and, and of I, course, the creativity and, gets us there. 
And to piggy, piggyback on that, Alex, I think it would be a sad thing if we did know everything, right? There would be no more liminal space. There would be no creativity. There would be no more imagination. And I think it's, um, I think it's, it's just a basic building block, block of humanity. And I think the fact that there's something out there more, something that we strive towards makes us better as, as, a, as a race. And Alex, there's a, a just to go back to Arthur C. Clarke, because you know, he really has something to say about everything with science. He has something to say about that too. There's a short story that I think is, is uh, tremendous. It's called The Nine Billion Names of God. And in this, uh, they pay, and I don't remember who the they is, I think it's a couple of companies, they pay these monks in Tibet to write down all the possible permutations of how to say the word or write the word God. And nobody knows why, but they just do. Well, as the, as the story ends, the monks have finished. They've come up with every possible way to describe the name of God. We know everything. There's nothing more to know. And the world ends. Everything disappears. That's because we didn't know all the different things. Uh, that's what kept everyone living. And as soon as we found everything out, life was over. And so, you know, Clark even has something to say about that, too. And again, that's a great short story called The Nine Billion Names of God. Yeah, that's a, there's, there's a bunch of those things. And of course we have, there's a number of ways to get in contact with us because, uh, and I've talked a bunch here at the end, the things that Dr. Fowler has to say, I mean, we trimmed so much that we could, we could provide for you. Um, so there's a lot more out there that, that deals with these sort of perspectives that we had too. I mean, originally we were just going to look at the campy stuff and then it just became that it was too important to look at at least a few of the different sections of science fiction and, and, I, I, and I, I find science fiction is not satisfying to me as a term. For me, it's more the liminal space of what, what could be, what might be. And so um, would anyone like to chime in before we finish up? Well, I see Brandon's got a point there too, which I like a lot. And, and again, I, as somebody who <sighs> works both with, with uh, students at the college level and students in the, the 7 through 12 area too, and I, mm -hmm. I can confirm that that's true. And it's everywhere. And, and I think I want to be very clear. It, it's much more than politics. It's much more than that because teaching is hard. Teaching science involves not just science. You've got to know math and math is hard. And so there's so many different dimensions to teaching anyway. Now you're talking about science. And so it is hard to do. And, and I think that that's a great point there, uh, Brandon. Um, I, 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 perhaps I wouldn't go so far as to say a failure, but there's no doubt that we could do better that we could do a lot more than, than we're doing now. Yeah. And I want to do a shout out to Susan Loman Thomas, who's one of our colleagues from the English department. Yesterday, they presented on science fiction from a variety of different viewpoints. So Susan's interest is in indigenous science fiction, which adds a whole new dimension to what we understand as science fiction. So um, I, I would recommend to you guys that you go out looking for alternative viewpoints, even in the science fiction world. If you're interested in a feminist viewpoint, take a look at Ursula K. Le Guin. It's pretty interesting stuff. Um, and so I, I love, I want to go back to the beginning where Ursula K. Le Guin says she's not imagining new worlds. It's not predictive. It's not future looking. It's what might be. What might be. And I think that's an important thing for all of us. We work together to create what might be, which is a better place for all well, of us. Well, that's that, right. That idea of hope, the positivity, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's, there's good things that can come out of this. And I'd agree completely that, that what can be, what's possible. And we, as long as we continue driving forward with that, whether it's going to be the, from the creative end or the scientific end, I think those, that's how we, you know, that's how the world doesn't end, right? That's how the monks don't come up with all the names of God. That's how we do that. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, it has been such a pleasure and we are, we've been honored as a department to be invited to participate in this conference. Thank you so much. Thanks guys. We really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Jackie and David for a wonderful presentation and discussion. You will be able to catch the recording after the conference. Don't forget that. And we definitely hope that you will be joining us for the remaining of the day for some equally exciting sessions that we have coming up. Thank you.